Hello, everyone. I'm Rob Gibbons, and welcome to our Xamarin University guest lecture. I hope everyone is having a great October. Joining us today, we have Adam J. Wolf. Uh, Adam writes one of my absolute favorite blogs at syntaxismyui.com. Uh, I learn so much there. I definitely suggest uh, subscribing to that. He's also a Xamarin MVP, and each week he publishes the weekly Xamarin newsletter, which is going to keep you up to date on all the latest in the Xamarin world. I also suggest uh, subscribing to that. Lots of great links in there. Today, Adam's going to help us with the hardest part of writing a successful app, which is making it beautiful. Uh, I know a lot of developers, myself included, are very bad at that. Adam's going to help us there, figuring out how we can do that and how we can leverage Xamarin Forms to do that. Now, as always, if you have questions, just use the GoToWebinar control panel and ask questions there. I'll try to answer any that I can, and if it makes sense, I'm just going to interrupt Adam and ask the question right then. But I might leave some of the questions until the end for Adam to answer at the end as well. So if your question isn't answered immediately, don't worry. We will get to it, I promise, uh, at the end. All right, so Adam, it's all yours. Okay, thanks a lot, Rob. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. Just let me know when you can see that. Looks good. Okay. So hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for coming to the, this guest lecture. Um, my main goal today is to introduce you to how I work with Xamarin Forms, um, show you some of the benefits of learning a graphics editor with using it with, with Xamarin Forms, and to give you some advice uh, from my year plus with uh, running a production application in uh, Xamarin Forms. Like Rob said, my name is Adam J. Wolf. Um, I, I blog at Syntax is my UI. Email right there at adam at Adam J. Wolf. Please email me if you have any questions that might not be uh, good to ask them now. Um, I answer about a question or two uh, every morning about uh, Xamarin Forms. Um, so don't uh, don't worry about sending me email. I, I usually answer them right away. Um, I uh, tweet at uh, Twitter at Adam J. Wolf. And uh, Rob did talk about the weekly Xamarin newsletter. We are on our 60th week, um, and we are going strong. Uh, we got about a thousand uh, Xamarin developers that uh, subscribe to that uh, regularly, and uh, have a lot of fun um, producing that every week on Friday. So, just a little bit of background about me: um, I'm 20 plus years in the field. Um, I was a back-end developer, uh, especially Azure, Message Bus, Web Services, Microservices. Uh, I loved WCF, and I can't really explain why. Um, it's just some, something about it that I really liked. And uh, on any project that I was on, I was usually the guy that did it. Uh, for the front end, I was an HTML, JavaScript, Angular, JS. Uh, have been my UI of choice, and I've also written my fair share of Silverlight, WPF, and Windows Forms. Now I am a um, a mobile developer writing C# -sharp on the client and Node.js on the back end. I know that seems kind of odd. Um, I use Node.js mobile services to back the mobile app that um, we write at uh, my current employer. Uh, soon to be C# -sharp, when we originally started it, Node.js was the only choice for Azure mobile services, um, but we're going to be migrating that over to C# -sharp so that we'll use C# -sharp on the client and then C# -sharp at the back end. I've been writing Xamarin Forms code for well over a year, and I truly do love it. Um, but a little uh, disclaimer, I like writing my Xamarin Forms in code and not XAML. Uh, despite that, I still think we could be friends. Um, just give me a little, a little time to get my XAML on, and uh, I'll be up to speed with everybody else. When Xamarin does add support for F# -sharp PCLs in um, Xamarin Studio, I probably will be writing all of my Xamarin forms in F# -sharp instead of XAML or C#. -sharp. Um, I have four apps into production. Uh, some of them Android, some of them, some of them iOS. None of them Windows Phone. Um, the first app on the left over here, uh, our first app out was uh, GCU Maps application. I worked for Grand Canyon University, and GCU Maps was a three-week from start to store, literally file new project. Three weeks later, we were in the iOS store, and that was a Xamarin iOS project. 
all of the uh, design and all of the um, graphics that we use in that application came right out of um, a graphics editor that I used. Um, the only thing I reused from my company was some of the colors and um, some of the logo. The GC logo there is pretty common. Um, the next app here was a Xamarin Forms application uh, all the way from the beginning. This is the GCU student application. All the design and um, all of the code from this application uh, was uh, from me. I was a single developer and we needed to write a application where the students can figure out where their class was, when it was, where they needed to go, how much their bill was, and things like that. So that application's uh, been out for a while. We've deployed it 15 times to iOS and Android. It is backed by the, those Azure mobile services and it uses iBeacons. And this is a complete Xamarin Forms application. We have code reusability for Xamarin Forms close to 99, maybe 98% if I actually counted up all the lines. We have very, very few. Um, we have very, very few uh, specifications for just iOS or just Android. So mainly those things are the beacons. Um, those are different on both platforms. Obviously, Xamarin Forms doesn't do the beacons for you. Um, so that's most of the code that's in that 1% to 2% that wasn't reusable. Uh, the next application, design and code, was from um, an application that I built during recording of teaching a Xamarin Forms uh, 1.2, 1.3 class. This class is no longer available because it was Xamarin Forms 1.2, 1.3. So some things have changed, so we, we, we've taken that out. We don't, uh, I don't have that up on the, the blog anymore. The fourth one here, um, some good folks down in Brazil contacted me and asked me to write um, their front-end Xamarin Forms application uh, for their company. And this company was called Trackbox, and you can find this app in, in the stores. And basically, they gave me some comps or some uh, pictures of what they wanted the UI to look like, and they asked me, hey, we want a XAML, um, you know, XAML code, styling all around, and we want it to look like this. And uh, I did that for them. All of it was in Xamarin Forms. It happened pretty easily. The styling was actually pretty nice, um, and, it's, it, and it can be found in the store today. The last one, uh, we're actually looking to do another application for my company called GCU Life. That application is going to be publicly facing and not require a sign-in. We are debating whether to do that in Xamarin iOS, Xamarin Android, or use Xamarin Forms again. I think that I don't think there's anything that we wouldn't be able to do in Xamarin Forms, but uh, we might want to actually dip our toe into just using Xamarin iOS and um, Xamarin Android. Okay, so that's a little bit about uh, my work history. Now, like Rob was saying, that um, I have some stuff on my blog, and back when we first started the GCU uh, applications, um, you know, we had Xamarin 1.2, 1.3. We didn't know if Xamarin would be a good choice to go, or we would use Xamarin iOS or Xamarin Android. So, and I didn't like the vision coming from Xamarin because Xamarin kept talking about Duplo blocks and forms over data for Xamarin Forms. And I looked at this and I said, I looked at the platform, I looked at Xamarin Forms, and I said, I think this is much more capable than Duplo blocks. I mean, you know, Duplo blocks, they're the big, chunky blocks that you give a like a two or a three year old, and they're putting them in their mouth. They're not really like stacking them up and making anything. Uh, I really looked at the platform and I said, can this really do something better than Duplo blocks? So, I decided to try to use Xamarin Forms and Anger to create a you know, beautiful looking UI or UI that you would swear came from uh, Xamarin iOS or Xamarin Android. And this is some of the things that came out of it. Um, some of these things, all of these are blog posts, all the code is available for you uh, to get uh, off my blog or off of uh, GitHub, so if you thought that any of these things were um, Xamarin uh, iOS or Xamarin Android, they're not. They're 100% uh, Xamarin Forms. Uh, there is a few um, plugins used here, especially for the circles, uh, for the faces in the list. I use uh, James Montemagno's um, circle uh, renderer. Um, but everything else, it just comes from uh, Xamarin Studio and a graphics editor that I use. Okay. So the graphics editor that I use is called Sketch. Now I use Sketch because um, Adobe Illustrator was way too was way too scary for me. There are so many buttons and so many things going on with that program. I looked at it and I said, I don't know if this is going to be good for me. 
So around three years ago, um, I originally bought Sketch because I wanted to develop things that looked good. Um, you know, as a developer, doing this for 20 years, being a back-end developer, um, you know, my UIs were gray with Battleship gray with like black and that was it. I mean maybe there was one or two colors um, but that was really it and I looked at some of the things that people were making and, and I said I want to be able to do that and the only way I'd be able to make really good looking UIs is if I controlled more of it. You know most of us do not have the luxury of working with a designer. Most of us work alone, um, usually on a project, maybe with a, maybe with a couple of people. I don't know about alone, but we wouldn't be working with um, designers all the time. And if you have a designer on your team, you're pretty lucky. I've been working for many years in the field, and I've worked with a designer once. Um, and hopefully, um, I will work with more designers in the future. I really like what they do, and I would like them to do make things really really nice for me so that I can just use those assets but when you're all alone the only thing you can really do is kind of roll up your sleeves and figure this out yourself um, if you can use Visual Studio you can learn how to use Sketch now I am a uh, colorblind person I like using Sketch uh, it allows me to do a whole bunch of things that I normally wouldn't be able to do so let's just take a really quick tour of Sketch let's just go around here we go and here is Sketch. Whoops. Let's make that bigger. Now, Sketch is, is not as scary as some of the other programs. You could see it's actually pretty minimal. Uh, down the left hand side, we have a bunch of pages, um, and each one of the pages has separate. Um, properties of what's inside of it. Each one of the items actually has a property pane to the right. And in here we can do things like add borders, add shadows, and stuff like that. The top bar is pretty minimal. As you could see, if this was um, Adobe Illustrator, the top would be crammed, and then the whole left side would be crammed with different tools. So for Sketch, our tool palette actually is pretty small. Um, you know, we have vectors, pencils, some shapes that are in there, regular text, an image, artboard slices. So the main thing that you would be using is some of the shapes, especially, let's say, if you wanted to create a star. Uh, for your application, you can throw a star down. You can then change its color to something that you would like. And then if you so chose, you can add some shadows to it and then bump those shadows up. And then once you had your icon or whatever you wanted to use, let's say you wanted one filled and one not filled, then you can easily then just take these two guys and then start exporting them. And one of the great things about um, Sketch is it really understands that we're iOS uh, developers and it automatically has the sizes, you know, 1x, 2x, 3x, and it'll actually export them with the correct naming in the back end. So when you export these layers and you go to the desktop and you export them, you're actually going to export, export three files for each one of these. So you actually would have six files left over. Um, hey, Sketch was pretty, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, quick question. If you have a zoom tool on your a machine if you're looking at the menus can you just zoom in a little bit if you don't have one don't worry about it but if you do I, I, that'd be great i don't i will okay. uh, i will try to i'll try to fix that no problem um, so um so if we just get out of here you can see that i exported i just exported my items here and they're there and then I could just take these and actually put them into my Xamarin Forms application. And we'll show, I'll show a little bit more about creating icons and stuff like that. So quick question, will that uh, create Android as well, Android icons? Sure will. So what you basically do is you could just say uh, make exportable. You could change this to, you know, 512W, or if you wanted the 48, all you do is 48, hit tab, um, and then when you do the uh, export for the bitmap, just hit save, there's your bitmap right here. The one thing that it doesn't do is it doesn't put it directly into the drawable folders that you probably would like, but there is a plugin that you can use that you just select an item and then you use the plugin and it will export it all in the different sizes, so uh, 48 by 48, 72 by 72, 96 by 96. Um, and so it makes creating icons and assets for Android and iOS actually pretty easy. Um, with the plugin, it definitely helps. Obviously, with uh, iOS, we have our lovely naming system, but for Android, we definitely need those uh, drawable folders. 
And those icons, can they have transparent backgrounds? Yes, they do. Uh, so if we did, yeah. So if we did it before, let's uh, let's do this again. Let's add a new shape. Let's do that star again. So this star, when I actually make it exportable, um, it is actually going to be transparent um, when I export it out. Uh, one of the things you can do is then uh, grab a slice if you want it to be in the center and then make this slice exportable and you'll see that the background color, there is none, I'm not exporting any background color at all. Um, you don't want to select trim transparent pixels because it'll actually trim it down to the size. But for uh, Android icons, you can definitely use it and then uh, slice it out like that. Okay. All right. Okay, to create great design in uh, Xamarin Forms uh, for iOS and Android, um, you really must make your app look native on each platform. An iOS looking app on Android looks just as odd as an Android app on iOS. Now Xamarin Forms does help us by using the native controls, but you as a developer and possibly the designer must respect each platform's design guidelines. Uh, these two will help you understand uh, what each user and OS expects. Um, I don't know about uh, most of you, but if you've not taken a look at the Google Material Design documentations, you're definitely missing out. Um, it is one of the best design docs I have ever seen. It has some really, really great advice in there. I have stolen many things from it um, to help uh, write iOS applications also um, with using some of the Material Design docs. Um, some of the things that have happened with um, the new leadership at iOS going from a very schemic fork design to a more flat design from some of the changes that they had was a little striking. So, you know, in, in iOS, we used to have, you know, faux leather with stitching and stuff like that, and we used to have, like, green felt and stuff like that. Now it's all... Uh, very white, it's it's very uh, stark in contrast, but in Google Material Design, you know, and, um, Google has uh, brought forward um, a nice design that doesn't go as far as what um, Apple has done, and it really makes the UI look really good. And I know, Rob, that you just tweeted this morning that you wish you could get iOS hardware with the Google Design and Google Play and Google Play services in the back end, um, and I thought that was quite funny because I was thinking exactly the same thing, that if I could get a little bit of more material design in my iOS applications, I would really like the way that looks. Um, you know, right now iOS is very muted. Your main color is always going to be white on both platforms, but color is is somewhat sparse, and you know, depending upon what you're looking at, especially for the applications that are built in. Um, but I really do like what Google is doing with Material Design, and their design doc is fabulous. You really, you really should take a look at it. It's um, laid out great. It gives you some do's and some don'ts, and we're going to go over some of those now. And uh, I'm just going to pick out a few sections uh, of the design docs and, and go through them. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's talk about colors. Like I told you guys, I am a colorblind developer, and Sketch makes working with colors uh, pretty easy for me. Um, so let's take a look at what it says inside of the Google uh, Material Design Docs. It says that color is color in Android is an inspiration. It's inspired by bold hues juxtaposed with muted environments, deep shadows, and bright highlights. I don't know who writes these things, but I think they they moonlight as a you know writing uh, copy for catalogs. Um, I don't know about seeing juxtaposed. Um, inside of a material design doc is, is great. I, I think it's funny. I, I really like it. Um, but what Google is basically telling you here is to limit your selection of colors by choosing a couple of colors, primaries, um, maybe an accent color, um, and then use opacity for text. So let's take a look at what they mean by this. Now Google says that you should be taking like a primary color, so if this was an app that we were building and we would want it indigo as our primary color, we would pick a primary color in the 500 range, so this range right here, and then we would pick a lighter 
and then a darker color. So maybe we'd pick a 300 and then maybe the 700 or maybe we'd go even farther to the 900. So in our code, in our back end, we would have three colors. So um, we would have three of these colors and then we would pick an accent color. I don't know about pink with you guys, but uh, it really wouldn't be my first choice. This is really what they're telling you. Only pick a couple of colors. Uh, don't go crazy is their main advice for you. In iOS, um, they say the color helps indicate interactivity, impart vitality, and provide visual continuity. So I don't know about impart vitality, um, but their main goal here is to obviously help you pick a primary color. So if you create multiple custom colors, they want to make sure that they work well together. And they, they want you to pay attention to color contrast in different contexts. So color contrast is very important for usability. Um, and they want you to be aware of color blindness. Um, the key color that you want to use on, on iOS is really to indicate something that's very important. Um, and they really don't want you to uh, distract people with too much color. Okay. So um, one of the things that I like, one of the techniques that I use all the time is called sampling. Um, in other parts of the world, it's called stealing. Um, yes, that's right, stealing. Uh, we, call it, we called it lifting in New York back in the day. Uh, today in Phoenix, it's commonly known as theft. Um, get to know and love your sampling tool. Um, and your sampling tool inside of Sketch will help you um, lift colors out of UIs so that you can look at them and try to possibly use them in your application. So here are three applications that are on my phone and I use the sampling tool inside of Sketch to lift the colors off and then put them down on the bottom here. So we have Twitter, Pinterest, and Flipboard. And if you can see on Twitter, they have their primary blue color, they have an accent color that they're using, and the rest of the colors are an intensity off of black, right? So they have black, they have a gray, they have a lighter gray, and these are the colors that Twitter uses in their application. So major application really only using maybe five colors, and most of them are black. So the main color that they use here is white. Um, and it's pretty telling of exactly what you do. So if you make your application look like Twitter, um, it's going to look it's going to look pretty good. They've done a lot of work. They've done a lot of usability work on it. And the closer you can come to an existing application, major application like these, the better your design will be. It'll be less uh, jarring and it'll be more friendly to users, especially if you're showing lists of, of tweets back and forth, your application will look good. So for Pinterest, I mean, obviously their colors are almost as close to Flipboard, um, but Pinterest does it even more. I mean, they have one primary color and the rest of them are intensities of black. So, so uh, darker colors for the uh, more important text, lighter colors for the least important text, and things like that. So in this, you could see that the most important thing here is obviously the plus, and then obviously they use um, create a board here. Text is is very very light, and they want you to see that this is the main thing that they want you to look at, and this is the sub thing that they want you to look at. So that's why they use the text colors like that. Uh, for Flipboard itself, I mean, besides the graphic, um, they're using a very some of the same kind of color palette. It's one primary color, an accent color, and then um, some colors off of black. So let's take a look at what this would look like in Sketch and how you use Sketch to do this. So in Sketch, what I do for every application that I create, I create a page inside of Sketch for colors. Basically, I just throw a couple of uh, circles on here and then I start setting their colors. The main color that I always use um, is always like a brand color. So I, for every app, for every uh, company that I've ever worked with, they had a brand color. Uh, usually you just go on the website and you look for um, color palettes or their marketing materials. And some of their marketing materials will have the colors that they want you to use to represent the company. Um, so for Coca-Cola, it would be red, right? Um, for Pepsi, it would be one of their blues. Um, so some companies, and for GCU, the company that I work for, um, it's purple. It's, a, it's definitely purple for them. Um, so if I was going to use a blue color um, for my main color, and I, I picked this color, and this was the brand color, I needed a light and a darker color. So to a lighter color would be moving this circle towards white, and for a darker color, it would be moving the circle towards black. 
is an easy way to get a lighter and darker color of the one main color that you have here. And then I just really picked an accent color. Um, so for my brand color, you can see where the circle is. And then if I go to the lighter one, you'll see it just shoots over to the left here. It was over here. Now it's over here. And then for the brand color, if I want a darker color, I just select the darker color and it just goes further down towards the black. And then my accent color was just a color that I thought looked good with the blue. And, and we'll get to this side over here in some of the next slides. So what I do when I have those colors and I can go to sketch and I can say, okay, well, that's the color that I want. Sketch actually gives me the hex color of that color. So any color that I choose in here, I will be able to get the hex color. I then take that hex color and I go to my app.xaml and I put them in. So here I have an uh, easy, uh, in the app.xaml, in the resources, um, in the app resources, I put a couple of colors down and I reuse these colors throughout uh, the application for doing styling. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that this helps with is it obviously helps is if you change your light color, your dark color, or your accent color, you really only have to change it to one place and you just change it in the app.xaml. Now I, like I said before, I like writing my styles in code. Um, so what I do is I create a stylekit.cs class, which is just a static class. And that static class just has some uh, public properties on it. And they would be brand color, brand color light, brand color dark, and brand accent color. So your resource dictionary to start out would look really like this. And this is just a way for us to corral our colors together. The next part of a good um, Xamarin Forms design is going to have to talk about topography. Much of your app revolves around text. If it's one of the mo it's one of the most important parts of the design, unless you're making games. I mean, games have a little bit of text in it, but most of the most of the things about um, doing games is about the graphics and gameplay, not really about the text. Um, even Pinterest and Instagram have a lot of text. Even though they're really about the images, they do have a lot of text. So for Android, in the material design docs, um, talk about one thing. They say use Roboto, um, which is really easy um, to sort of follow this advice. And they say, and this is a quote, Roboto has been refined extensively to work across a wider set of supported platforms. It is slightly wider and rounder, giving uh, it greater clarity and making it more optimistic. Um, so I don't know exactly how Roboto is more optimistic than Helvetica, but I guess it, I guess it might be. So um, I have one warning for people that are creating Xamarin Forms applications on Android. And this is something that happened to me. Uh, we did the GCU application. We released it. And um, everything's great. One of the developers that had an Android device actually downloaded it and put it on, put it on their device. And they, said, they showed it to me because, you know, hey, Adam, this looks pretty good. And I look at it, and he must have changed his system font to something like Comic Sans. And it looked terrible. <laughs> I don't know about you, but every, every text in the app used the default font the sans serif font, and because he swapped the base font out, it was Comic Sans just all over the place. And to me, it looked pretty pretty bad. But he liked the way it looked. Uh, he you know, he changed his own um, Roboto out for uh, some Comic Sans equivalent on Android, and um, it did change the way the app looked. So um, onboarding some of your own um, fonts might be a good idea on Android, um, but it's something that you have to be aware of that will happen to you if you use uh, Android. So for uh, iOS, so in iOS apps, they say use San Francisco as the font, and this, this comes straight from the HIG documentation too. Um, they say, in, uh, this is a quote, in general, use a single font throughout your app. Mixing several, several different fonts can make your app appear uh, fragmented and sloppy. Instead, use one font and just use a few styles and sizes. So I have some warnings for you. And these are warnings that, um, that you would see in a regular HTML application. In some fonts, you basically shouldn't use. Um, these are really cliche fonts. Um, so 
if you try to use the papyrus font for something that's really old, it looks like the you know ancient Egypt script. Don't don't do that. Obviously, Comic Sans I'm not really a fan of unless your uh, app is about comics. Um, Lethos is another font. Um, if your if your app is about the, uh, a Greek wedding, you know my big fat Greek wedding kind of text, then then it's understandable. Futura, um, if your if your app is about outer space, maybe maybe stay away from that one. If it's if it's not about outer space, um, and then Lobster. Um, Lobster is a very uh, overused font. Um, I know you can, you might even be able to Uber a lobster roll to your desk, um, but it's just something, some of those fonts you really shouldn't be using in your applications. So for fonts, um, in the app.xaml, what I do is I use the on platform and I select three fonts for Android and iOS. They're, they're the same font, but they're just different styles. So for a regular font family, I pick in iOS, I pick Helvetica New. Um, for iOS 8, San Francisco wasn't in there. For iOS 9, San Francisco is in there, so you could use that. Um, for Android, regular sans serif. Um, if Roboto is the default font, you'll get the Roboto uh, sans serif. Um, and then a light font family, this is just a thinner version of the same font um, for you know things that might be quite large. If you use a very large text uh, for like headers and stuff like that, you want to use a thinner, lighter uh, style. This is where the light font family would come into. And then for iOS, we use Helvetica New Light. And then for Android, is the sans serif light. And then the same thing for the medium font family. This is not exactly bold. It, it's uh, not as bold as bold. Maybe it's half the weight of bold. Um, but it's in between the regular and uh, bold. Um, so we use the Helvetica New Medium and the Sans Serif Medium here. And then inside of app.xaml, we'll put this in. And now we have colors for our application. And we have the fonts uh, or the font families for our application. So your resource dictionary should look like this, colors and then font family, or could look like this. Um, another thing that I do is I create a typographic scale just like our old friend HTML with you know H1 through H5, um, but what I do is I create this scale, and it's based on a typographic scale. That typographic scale goes from you know, 12, 14, 16, 20, 34. Um, it is a uh, preset scale that looks pretty good on the web, and I'm really trying this out in uh, Android and iOS for my Xamarin forms so that I don't just willy-nilly pick different font uh, sizes throughout my application. It, if your application has consistent font sizing, it'll look better to the user. Uh, it won't look so fragmented and disjointed. And too many types and sizes and styles at once can really wreck a layout. Um, we're using only three font types um, and you know the regular, the light, and the medium font. And here you could see that we use the light on both, then the regular, and then the medium you could see is a little bit thicker than the regular. And some of these are used as um, button text and some of them are used as you know, just regular text um, for the screen. And obviously large text we use for the light one because we want it to be thinner. Um, it might look too overweight if it was regular or medium up in the top. Normally this gigantic font would only be used for things like maybe telling the person the day um, in a calendar app. So if today was the ninth, you would just use the nine up there um, and that's it. So it's not really for a large amount of text. You can see it hardly fits in here. Um, I couldn't even put the um, font size on it because then it would wrap around. Um, so you really want to use this in very sparingly and definitely at the top. So in your uh, uh, app.xaml, what I do is I just put this into um, app.xaml and then I have all my sizes. Um, I kind of don't follow the H1 through H4. Um, they, they're kind of reversed, so uh, display four font is actually the biggest one, and display one font is the smaller one. Um, so you can see like the title font and the subhead font would be used for lists and stuff like that, um, but you'd be able to uh, take a look at them. So the resource dictionary now looks like this. So we have colors, we have font family, and we have font sizes, all of them in there. So let's talk about the colors of text. So this is a um, tip that I picked up directly from the Material Design Docs. And these screenshots here are directly from the Material Design Docs uh, from Google. Uh, I think it's brilliant. I don't mind saying that I stole this because I, I thought this was excellent. I've been using this uh, for like six months or more. Um, 
one of the things that they say is instead of picking different colors um, for different um, text types, um, they say use opacity. So on a light background, so this center one here, on a light background, let's just say it's white, they say to use a base color for your text as black. For the primary text, they say use 87% opacity. So basically what they're saying is, they're saying don't make it completely opaque, um, just make it an 87% opacity. So you're getting 13% of the background shining through the color. Now the text color would be this color under my mouse. It wouldn't be this color that the text is over here. It actually would be this color that's under the mouse or the background color here. So this text color might be the um, text color in, a, um, in the text cell inside of a list view. This would be the text. The secondary text color would be the detail, and that is a 54% opacity. Disabled hint text, 38, it would be this color. And then dividers would only be 12. So on a white background, a divider that was only 12 would be pretty interesting. You're getting 80% of the color from the background coming through your divider, but you'd only have to use one color. It would be the black color, and you're just changing the color based upon uh, the opacity. Now they do the same thing and they flip it on the other side. So on a dark background, even this black, they're saying use a white text and for the primary text make it 100% opaque so it's, it's completely solid. Um, for secondary text make it 70% so 30% opaque so 30% of the color in the background is bleeding through the white and you can see we get this kind of this gray. Then 30 for disabled or hint text, so that means that 70% of the background is coming through. And then for dividers, only 12% is going to be white, and then you're going to get most of the background. And what this does with colored backgrounds and accent colors, it actually changes the color of the text. So let's take a look at Sketch, and let's see what this looks like. Okay, so this second part here that we looked at has um, the white background, and here's the primary, the secondary, the disabled, and the divider. And then on the black background or a dark background, we have the primary, the secondary, the disabled, and the divider. You can see the divider is so dark, you can almost not see it, but using dividers in uh, Xamarin Forms, you won't really don't want those dividers to stand out too much. They would be very subtle, and this would work. So one of the keys is what if we change this background, this light background color to using our sampling tool to, let's say, our a light brand color. So you can see that they're not, obviously the one that's very dark is very black. It's very, very dark, but the lighter one actually looks like a blue. And then we could do the same thing for the primary for the dark. So let's use the dark color, and you can see how the text, even though it is um, one color, white on this case, black on this case, changes the color from white to actually being partially the dark brand color. And this is pretty interesting because it doesn't require that you pick each one of these colors, um, either on dark or on light. Really, you're just picking white and black and then just setting the opacity to change the colors. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So this is, a, this is just a simple Xamarin Forms application, uh, Android on the left, and then iOS on the right. So what we do here is I just have the text colors on the white background and text colors on the dark background. And I've tried to do the brand colors. Now this is one, one case where it works very well. So what the, um, the on, we use the white on the dark colors and it came out very well. It looks really good, um, but when we try to use the, um, the white colors on the uh, background, this looks very washed out. It doesn't really look very good, so you're going to have to flip it like I did here. You see so the brand accent color is somewhat dark um, on this lighter color, so you're going to have to flip them around. But this just gives you an idea of what just setting the colors for the text to be one color and then modifying just the opacity makes some of the colors look really good, and you don't have to pick every single color that's out there um, that you would need for your app. So let's take a look at what this would look like in app.xaml. So in app.xaml, if we were going to do the primary text color, what we would use is the factory method from RGBA, and we would set this to black, 000 is black, and then we would set the opacity to 87%. 
Now for the secondary te text color, we would do the same thing, but the opacity would be 54%. Now this is for the dark colors on a light background. So when we do the other ones, we have to change the name a little bit. So with the primary text color on dark, we don't, this is fully opaque, um, so it's fully solid. We don't have to use from RGBA, so we just use the one color. And then for the secondary text color on dark, this is white, 255, 255, 255 is white, and then 70% is the opacity. So if we're going to look at our uh, app.xaml, it would look like this now, right? So we have our colors, we have our font family, we have font sizes, font colors, font colors on the light-hand side, font colors on the dark-hand side. So with that, we can do this we could start creating styles that combined all of these things together. So if we had a, the title label of our um, text cell, and then we have the subhead uh, style for our subhead there, we would just be able to pick uh, for the text color, we would say the primary text color, and then for the font, we would say the title font. Title font also has the font family in it, and this one style would include the font size, the font family, and the color. So Adam, quick question. Uh, sure. What are the performance implications of that, uh, particularly with view cells, which are typically uh, performance bottlenecks? It's a question from George. So one of the things that, so some of the advice that I'll give you down on the bottom is um, view cells need to be created within a very, very short amount of time. If you are creating um, view cells that take a long time to create, your application is not going to be very responsive. Um, this is something that is a problem in, you know, if you're using Objective-C on iOS, this becomes a problem. Um, and it's something that people need to worry about their performance. Now, if looking up the, through the um, visual tree for the static resources, so when um, you're looking at styles and you use a style down and let's say, a page and then inside the page you have a list view and then inside the list view you have your text cells. If going and looking up from the uh, text cell through the list view, through the page, back all the way up to the app.xaml for your resource dictionary is a problem, um, you're going to have to obviously find that out. And if, if that is a problem for you, you really should be pushing as much of those resources down as close to where you use them and where you create them. That's one of the issues that I have with using resource dictionaries. You know, on a, on a desktop client, on a desktop, you have a lot of horsepower to be able to in WPF or let's say in Silverlight, you had a lot of power where you can, you know, throw a core, uh, you know, so throw one of the cores of the machine to go look through all of the dictionaries, get them set up so that they're very fast and very performant. But on a mobile device, you know, you really don't have that luxury, um, especially how um, XAML currently today, how it's how it's made and how they initialize the XAML, uh, it could be a performance problem. So you really have to try this out yourself. Now with the new stuff coming up with XAML C, which is in uh, 1.5 for XAML forms, some of that might go away, um, but that's the reason why I use a static class for all of my styles. So I have one class that's called Style Kit. And I put all my colors, my fonts, my font sizes, my font colors inside of that static class. And in my XAML, I just have to put a namespace at the top to bring it in. And then I could use um, just a static resource um, or a static binding to the resource and then include it right there. And there's no penalty for going to look up through um, the dictionaries for it. I uh, hope that uh, answers your question there. Yeah, well, how about the... Uh the performance implications of actually having the transparency, the, the opacity uh, defined now? Um, uh, that I don't know. Obviously, um, if it's slower um, when you're using it, then you can just really go and get the color. So one of the things we can do for uh, sketch is we'll come back here and let's say you're doing it on, let's say you're doing it on white. Obviously, we can come through here with our color picker if we really needed to. Uh, let's create another oval and then let's actually sample this color. So this color is 212121 with no opacity. And if you wanted this color, this secondary color, you can then click it and then sample it and say, okay, well this color without opacity is 757575 with 100%. So you can actually get these colors 
and set them all you'd like. You don't have to use the opacity uh, for that if it's a, a performance concern. Um, you can definitely go after each one of the individual colors and then set them, especially if you know that most of your colors are going to be on white, which most of your text colors are probably going to be on white. Um, there might be a few colors that you would set on, um, on your maybe your brand color. Um, you would then be able to do it. So if we selected the, the background color, we selected this color, we can go after the, whatever the, um, the color is for this guy. So that guy is you know, 3BA2F4, and it's 100%, so there would be no opacity. Um, so you'd be able to get around that performance problem by not using opacity that way. Great, and then while we're on the topic, one more question about uh, performance. Uh, any performance optimization techniques for loading images and icons that are used multiple times on the same page? And then I'll let you get back to the presentation. No, that, I, I don't know. Um, for that one, I would have to be in that situation uh, to know that I have never had to, you know, prefetch or anything like that for an, an image. Um, you might be able to reuse the image source. I'm not even sure about that, so um, I would have to look into it. Great, thanks. And uh, George mentioned he actually has a library called Fast Image uh, Cell that could, oh, okay, could yeah. do that as well. So maybe maybe that would work. All right, so let's move on to uh, icons. Um, uh, so whether you use only custom icons or a mix of custom and standard icons, all icons in your app should look like they belong together uh, from the same family in terms of the size, the level of detail, and the visual weight. So for Android, um, in the design guidelines, it says um, Android icons should be simple, modern, friendly, and sometimes quirky. And, and this is one of the reasons why I like the, the material design guidelines. They're actually, they'll actually say quirky in it. Um, and this is a direct quote from there. It says, each icon is redu reduced to its minimum form with every idea edited to its essence. The designs ensure readability and clarity even at small sizes. Um, so Android icons are typically chunky, is the one word that I would use to describe them. Um, they're also very uh, strict with how they do things. So you'll see that there's not a ton of curves, except for the circles, um, on the icons. And the only time they really do put curves in it um, are mostly at the corners or unless it's required. Now, I really enjoy these icons. Um, they're quite uh, blocky, and you can see how they would look good at small sizes. They're basically melted down to the only thing that's needed. And that's really what your icons on Android should look like. For uh, iOS, it says the iOS icons should be simple, streamlined, and readily understood. Or, so too many details can make an icon appear sloppy or incomprehensible. Um, not easily mistaken uh, for one of the system provided icons is one of the things that they, they point out. They really don't want you recreating the system icons. Um, and then users should be able to distinguish your custom icon from the standard icons at a glance and readily understood and widely accepted. Um, so they say strive to create a symbol that most users will interpret correctly and that no user will find offensive. So that kind of goes without say. You really don't want to put offensive icons in there. And this is what the icons for iOS looks like. They're um, more square but much thinner. And even the ones that are filled out actually have more detail in it, more minor details in it than Android ever would. Um, so you could see why I would say that Androids are more chunky. And then for um, iOS, you want to actually use something that is a little thinner and maybe a little bit more detail. So one of the things that uh, Android does for, like, let's say, a pencil, they want it to be without the eraser top and stuff like that, without the lines or the grooves on it. It just needs to look like a pencil um, and just melt it down. Um, one of the packs that I use is called Pycons. If you're looking for Android or iOS icons, Pycons, I've been using Pycons for a really long time, and that is definitely one of the reasons why some of my Xamarin forms things look really good or look better is that I have this icon pack of like 1,400 icons from Pycons, and they're the thin icons uh, from them, and they're really helpful. They come in all the different sizes, but they also come in SVG. So the scalable vector graphics, for me, is the way I do most of my stuff. So let's take a look at some of these um, for these icons. So in 
in uh, PyCons, and let me open uh, PyCons. So this is the what you get um, when you order the um, icon pack from PyCons. You get this one sheet, and I, I use this sheet all the time, and I go through and pick the icons that I need. So you can see that there is quite a few icons in this pack, um, and then each one of them is pretty interesting. And they're mainly uh, um, iOS icons. As you can see, they're very detailed. They're very thin. They look very good on iOS. They come in the 1X, the 2X, and the 3X are already, but if you have something like Sketch, you can then take care of that for yourself. Um, but they just keep going and going. I rarely ever have a problem finding the right icon for my applications when I have a big icon pack like this. Um, you can obviously use uh, services like Icon Finder and things like that. But one of the things that I do for my icons for my Android application is I typically um, to get rid of some of the um, artifacts to make them more Android-like, um, I fill them in. It's usually an easy way to make them um, seem less busy is to actually fill them in. And when you looked at the uh, icons that we saw before, it was definitely, uh, some of them were mostly filled in. Another thing that you can do is to get these icons to look right on Android is to actually change how thick the actual icon is, right? So that's one of the things that it had is the shapes were a little bit thicker. But you can go even further and start getting into the icon itself and start getting rid of some of these artifacts that are in here. You could actually start deleting them and then making them back to square again, things like this to make these icons a little bit more acceptable on Android uh, than they are right out of the box. So Android does allow a little rounding on the corners, but if you then zoom back out, well, let's actually take care of this guy up here. Let's take care of him, we'll delete him, and then for this guy, whoops, let's get him back. We'll just square that back off, and then when we zoom back out, we have an icon that might look a little bit more appealing on an Android device than it does just using the stock one that looks good on iOS. All right, so let's go back to our slides. And I, I really want to encourage you guys to take a look at the icon packs. Um, PyCons is just the one that I've liked for a long time. There's a single developer or single designer that designs them and then sells them uh, direct. So let's talk about some assets. So this is one of the features of um, learning a graphics editor that I really like and which really helps me when I'm making stuff in Xamarin Forms. So let's take a look at Sketch again. So in some of the um, some of the Xamarin Forms and Anger um, series, I did a little bit of work um, inside of uh, sketch to help Xamarin Forms look a little bit better. And this first one is uh, one of the Xamarin Forms in Anger. This is Woofer. Uh, it was just the name I came up with. Uh, this uh, dog in the middle is Alabama Wolf. It's uh, one of my rescue dogs. He does have a brother named Washington. Um, I have not made a Xamarin Forms in Anger about Washington, and I might in the future. Uh, so for this application, or for this form that I did, for uh, Xamarin Forms and Anger, I really wanted to do a screen that was about a profile of somebody. Um, and what I wanted to do is wanted to show what using layers, either with a relative layout or a um, absolute layout, you would be able to do. And one of the things I wanted to do was I wanted to show how you can sort of modify images. So this would be just like a Twitter, you can upload a background image for yourself. I wanted to put a background image, but what I didn't want to do is I didn't want it to be square. I wanted to have a different arc to it. Um, and doing this technique is actually pretty easy if you have an editor. And all I needed to do was create an image that was this. All this image is, is a dome, and that's it. It's just an image, and what I basically do is I put the background image down first, and then I actually put the dome over it. As you can see, in Xamarin Forms, I just make sure they're lined up correctly, 
and then put them down there. And it was easy for me to do that. This dome took just a few seconds to make, and I was able to um, make the uh, Xamarin forms look a little different because people were saying, well, how did you do that? How did you cut this off like this? How were you able to do that? Was the picture already cut like that? And obviously, your users are not going to cut their images before they uh, upload them to your application. And I don't know if your application would do that itself, but all I really did is just throw it through a dome in there right on top of it using sort of one of the Z index of the absolute layout or relative layout. I put the background first, then I put the dome on top of it. Then I put Alabama's picture on top of that. And then on top of those, I put these two. So it definitely had a bunch of layers. And the more layers that you use inside of your Xamarin Forms application, I think the better it's going to look. And then let's look at Finder real quick. So Finder here was like a sub shop finding, uh, finding where to go get get some food. And the overlay that I made for Finder is really a simple cutout circle. That's all it is. And then it's right over a map. So you can see that it's just a simple image with the um, touch uh, uh, disabled was it, would able to put those two together using the same Z indexing on there. And it was easy, be, easy to fit that in there. All right, and then the last one, Hot Sauce. Hot Sauce was just an attempt to do a card view. Everybody was loving cards and shadows and stuff like that. So I said, okay, I'll, fine, I'll do that. So what a uh, card view basically is, is a cutout um, that is a little bit different. So um, let me uh, deconstruct this a little bit. So there is a background color. Let me just change this uh, background color to uh, white. OK, there you go. And this image was actually the image I created inside of Sketch. Um, so if we were to lock that guy back down again, let's lock him back. And then let's put a, a rectangle inside here. You could see that it covers it. But what if I took the index, like I did for these, and I push it backwards a little, you'll see that all of a sudden it looks like the items that I put behind this cutout image actually looked like they're standing on top of the this blue background that has this fade on it. So this was just an optical illusion that I made, and the only way I was able to make it was actually through uh, using Sketch. OK. Let's go back to the keynote. So here as we come to the advice, we'll come to the close of this presentation. Um, so some of the advice that I have for you guys is Learn how to use a graphics program. Uh, uh, it's not as intimidating as, um, or Sketch is not as intimidating as uh, Adobe Illustrator, but it definitely helps you uh, make better UIs and make, help you make better choices when either selecting colors or fonts and things like that. The other suggestion I have for you is read the HIG and material design. Um, these are definitely something that you want to get into uh, when you're creating applications either for iOS or for Android, and since we're Xamarin Forms developers, we create it for both. Um, get a good icon set. Now, some of the icons that you saw with PyCons definitely wouldn't be usable on Android, but with a little work and a little maneuvering, you can get them to look pretty good. Using one of those large icon packs is very uh, good because all of them look the same. They look like they're from the same user or from the same design is why I use a large icon set. When you use um, Icon Finder or other places like that, you might be able to get a few icons that look close to one another. But the problem is, is that if you pick it from two different people, you might have two different styles. Um, I personally create a style kit in code, and, and that's what I do. I don't really use uh, app.xaml very often, um, but I use a style kit. And either if you use the resource dictionary or if you don't, um, create one for yourself so your application is very consistent all the way through. Put all your fonts, your colors in the base of the application in app.xaml or in a uh, style kit. Shadows are hard. Um, this is the thing. I, I get so many questions about this. It's unbelievable. I originally did um, on the. Um, I originally did a um, card view, and people were asking, "Well, what about the shadows? What about the shadows?" Um, so shadows are hard to do on devices without support. Hopefully, in some of the next versions of Xamarin Forms, we get a Xamarin Forms frame 
that gets the border, allows you to set the border, the border radius, the border color, the X and Y, blur, and spread. I know that's a lot to ask, but if I would get those things, uh, shadows would be a lot easier. If you want to do shadows, you just go to sketch, um, pick a square, throw the shadow on there, export that out, and then use it as a background, and you can have a card view that is a background. Um, the next uh, piece of advice I have for you is lists should be simple. Um, this is uh, sort of the bane of existence for most developers on iOS or Android to make very performant lists. If your lists are very long, they should be simple. If your lists are short, they could be not lists and just be stacked panels of information. And this is where I used it here. This right here was just an exercise of showing um, the different things that are inside of a class. So a class is not going to have you know, a thousand or a hundred um, exercises in it, it's going to have 10, it's going to have 12. So that's why this was simple. But as a list, simple is better. Um, it's definitely what you want to do. All right, and that is it. If uh, Rob, if you have any other questions for me, I would love to answer them. Yeah, we have a, a few that I left towards uh, the end. So okay. we have a question uh, from Esteban about, uh, can you have only XAML styles for targeting Android without needing to change the Android native styling XML? Okay, I think I understand the, the question, I think. Um, so one of the things that I didn't get in here because we only really had an hour was you have a lot of ability in Android and iOS to change the styles before you even get inside of Xamarin Forms. So please don't think that styling for a Xamarin Forms application happens only inside of Xamarin Forms. Um, some of the best things that you can do is to use the themes in Android to change the way things look when Xamarin Forms runs. You can also do the same thing for iOS using the UI appearance protocols. So before you actually do um, you do Xamarin Forms that init in your um, app delegate. You can actually change things like on the slider. The slider, you can change its thumb color. You can change its after the thumb color and before the thumb color on that line without touching Xamarin Forms. When Xamarin Forms puts a slider on the screen, it'll actually use the colors that are set for you um, with the UI appearance protocol. Um, so that's definitely something that you can do. And you can do the same thing with the themes in um, Xamarin uh, um, with Android also. Um, I use themes a lot for um, the Trackbox application um, to do the uh, splash screen um, for Android because Android doesn't have a very specific splash screen so you can do a theme with a background with a nine patch image and then change a couple of things specifically for the slider or the on that application I changed how the search bar actually looked before Xamarin Forms even started and then once Xamarin Forms started on Android and I put a search bar up there that has a different colored background had a different color foreground and then I changed the uh, cancel uh, button color also. And that was before you got into Xamarin Forms. So don't think you have to be in Xamarin Forms to style stuff. Great. So Esteban, if you have a follow-up question on that, just uh, let me know. Another question from Brian is, how do you handle accessibility when you're hard coding your font sizes? So one thing with accessibility is it's somewhat of a battle. So in um, my current application that I write for GCU, we're an education institution. We're a for-profit uh, college. And one of the things that we have to do is we have to go through um, accessibility. And the accessibility story on iOS is actually pretty great. Um, inside of iOS, um, you could say, you know, I want to turn on accessibility and I want to increase the font size. And that's basically where it's left. So I can set the font size to whatever I want. And they can, when they're running their application, increase that font size through the settings app and then go over and the font sizes will be increased throughout the application. For Android, that story is a little bit different. Um, it, it somewhat works the, the same way, um, but you have to... Um, Put your font sizes to some, you know, to some number. I know we can use the inboard device micro, uh, medium, and large, and stuff like that. But um, for iOS, it still works. Um, when they increase the font size in the settings, it will increase in your application. Great. Okay. And uh, another question from uh, Yuri: How do you adjust to different screen sizes? So, for example, in the hot sauce the background blue image fits nicely in the screen that you showed 
what if we run this on the iPad? How does it stretch? So for stretching that, it's really, so the, the card example that I really showed you was um, it doesn't really work for large and small sizes. So that's one of the things that we have to sort of um, get around is because we can't draw and because we can't use SVG yet, uh, hopefully that's coming in uh, Xamarin Forms in a native way, um, we have some problems when we actually create things the way we do. Um, in an iPad, it wouldn't, it wouldn't look bad, but maybe on the iPhone 4, it would look a little squished. Um, the uh, graphic would be, um, would be stretched correctly, um, but you know the thing that you put behind it, whatever stack panel it was, if it was too long, it might actually go below, and you wouldn't be able to see it and stuff like that. So, it's definitely a technique of showing what Xamarin Forms can do. Uh, should you do that? Uh, maybe not in every case. So, yeah, if we're using sort of the normal what's available out there, um, and you're targeting directly to the phone, um, then you can use it. If you're if you're saying that you're supporting iPhone five all the way up, you should be fine. But if you're going to iPhone 4 or if you're doing Android and you expect to be on a flip phone, it's not going to look good. Okay. And uh, one more. Uh, actually, another one just came out. Uh, are you going to have the slides available for this? Can, I can. Gonna... Okay. Then they will be available from the Xamarin University website. You'll send it over to me and we'll get that up there with the materials and with the recording like we do for all the guest lectures. And a uh, question from uh, George. Have you seen the work that George has done about uh, embedding pages in pages to create uh, totally custom UIs? So, George, I wonder if you have any opinion of that technique, if you've seen it before. Um, I have not seen it. Um, so for the, for the past couple of, let's say, uh, past six weeks, um, if it has come out in that time, I must say that I have not read everything that is out there for Xamarin Forms. When I do the newsletter, I try to read every single article um, as much as I possibly can. And then uh, for the last six weeks, because we're bringing on a new developer, um, my duties at work have gotten a little bit more intense. So I really haven't been able to read everything that's out there. But George, I do know some of your work, and it's uh, it's awesome, um, especially the... Um, the list view stuff um, is something that I've been taking a look at um, for uh, my application, specifically at work. So I haven't looked at it. Um, I really can't speak about it, but uh, I'll definitely check it out. All right, so fantastic. And one more comment from George, which I will uh, finish up with because I think it reflects all of our, our opinions. Where George says, thank you, Adam, for the excellent presentation and for all your work in the Xamarin community for your blog and your weekly Xamarin newsletter. It's uh, all fantastic. So thank you uh, so much. Really appreciate it. I know I learned a lot. And uh, like I said, UI design is one of my, my weak spots. So it's great to see all of this information, how to use Sketch and things like that. 